So there was three main obvious examples of high technology in Egypt that does not line up with the tools that the civilization, the earliest right. official civilization of Egypt had. What were, what were those three examples of high technology that they had? The ones that I use in particular are the, I think when it comes to the engineering aspect is uh, the evidence for machining. So this is, this is, this is the, the cutting and polishing of stone and of very, very hard types of stone in particular. Uh, you're talking about things like granite and basalt and diorite, which are, if you've, anyone's familiar with the Mohs scale of hardness, can be anywhere from like six to eight on the on the Mohs scale of hardness. This is the the Mohs scale M of M hardness. M O H S Mohs scale of hardness. So it's it's basically like you know you take a harder material and if it scratches the surface material, it, the, the, another material it's harder than that. So okay. it starts at you know your fingernails like a, a two or the two or a three, and then diamond is the top of the scale okay. at, at a ten. Okay. Yeah. So you get to ten, and that's. That's the top scale. So you know, steel, uh, iron is like a five and a half, six. And steel is like a like a six. Um, things like that. So you're talking about stone that's harder than steel. Okay. Uh, wow. Granite. Holy. <laughs> Basalt's fuck. a little bit harder. Um, there's even examples in that. We get to it with the vases, but there's, there's yeah. examples of stuff made from corundum, which is a nine. Like it's literally just about as hard as diamond. But there's mm -hmm. vases made from this that that display all these uh, this evidence of machining. So. So it's not just the fact that these stones were used, but the, there is evidence in the stonework of, of frankly, power tools. Something's been used to to carve these stones at a very rapid rate. Yeah. So some examples. So this here. is uh, this is different. He's talking about some of the bigger stones with like the flat but surfaces, right? There's a good there's a good saw cut. Yeah, there's a good one with an angle on a saw cut you can find. But that's not a bad example either. Uh, that's still a that, that's part of the machining discussion, mm -hmm. and that's a bigger tube. That's that's an even bigger tube drill. Michael, look for one of the pictures of the rock that looks like it was cut by a big circular saw. Yeah, go to uh, yeah, it's in tooling. When you showed some of these, like you were pouring water over the top of these things that were cut flat. Yeah, so you can see the striation. So what one of the so when it comes to machining, you're talking about different types of cutting techniques. There's there's tube like circular saws, tube drills. There's also straight saws, uh, and 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 after that you have machining and, and like polishing. So there's there's a there's it's not a natural. This isn't um, it, Michael. That's one of them. That's that's okay. the, that's so that's a cut that's into a, a block of basalt at, at Giza. Keep going. Um, Looks like it was cut down the center. Yes, it was. Yeah, there's a there's a number of examples of of that on there, um, in that directory. No, Michael. Into, yeah, so yeah, there's there an go. example of of circular saw cut being dipped into basalt, which is harder than granite, by the way. More, more. So could a normal like concrete saw, like a demo saw, cut sure. through this rock? Yeah, uh, it could because well. Tile saws and things like that that are diamond, they're, they're diamond tip blades. So right. that's the closest analogy we have to the the evidence that's in the stonework. So that that's the thing. There's then there's been a bunch of I dive into a lot of the experiments and the research that's been done in these, the history of of investigation into these different types of cutting. So tube drills, circular saws, cutting stones, the grinding method, the pounding stones. You know, this has been an ongoing discussion for 150 years there has been people that have been looking at this and scratching their head for like 150 years and going this can't have been done with these primitive tools that we've found in the archaeological record versus the auth you know the, the establishment saying well these are the tools that we found so therefore these must have been the tools that we used and it's just mm -hmm. like you can't use those tools to show us the same result some something else was done and and uh you know we we know what tools the dynastic egyptians there you used. go yeah that, that's so, one of the great examples yeah so this is a really one of my favorite examples actually. So this is a block of stone that's uh, at uh, a place can, called. Abusir. Can you full screen this? But yeah, so there's a block of stone at at, at Abu Sia that's that is. Oh, there you a, go. It's you nearly, just passed it. It's nearly cut all the way nope. through. <laughs> Keep going. There you go. That's a different one, but that's okay. that's fine. That's a good example too. That's that's actually a place called uh, Abu Rawash. So you see the arc, right? There's a, there's a clear circular arc to this stone. Yes. So it's a it's either a drops, it's like a, what you would call a, a a swing saw or a circular saw that has that has cut this stone. And the the, the one that we saw earlier that's at Abu Sia actually has a little lip at the end of it. So it's it's like it hasn't quite cut all the way through the stone, but there's a little like over lip that's still there from thousands of years of weathering. And through that little lip, we can tell that the blade of this thing was very thin, a couple millimeters at best. Mm -hmm. And when you measure out the arc of it, you're talking like 30 feet diameter, like some huge processing plant cutting this. And then you also see striations uh, on the on the stone itself that shows you how that saw progressed through the stone, which was quite rapidly. Now, th this is... 
amazing evidence because you can now sort of determine the the rate at which the saw progressed through the stone, which is turns out to be quite quite rapid. And you can compare that to the experiments that have been done in the orthodox model, which says that, well, what they did was they got a big copper bar and they grind and they just ground sand with water on it and they just went back and forth for days and days, mm -hmm. days and days. And there's been a bunch of experiments that look at how long that takes. And these are like a couple of the like guys like Dennis Stocks that are, that are on the mainstream side that have done a little bit of work on this. And it's just the, 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 the numbers are, are insane. And you, you also, you don't get the same marks using that technique. And one of the major problems with it is, is that you wear away the copper bar at about the same rate that you're wearing away the stone. Right. So, and when you start to extrapolate that, so for example, I think I calculated that uh, there's a box, there's a, a box that's in um, the uh, second pyramid at Giza, at, at uh, Kafre's uh, pyramid. It's a granite box, it's like 10 feet long and you know four or five feet wide. And, I, and using the experiments and the, the rates that we've done to, to do the grinding method, just to make the six cuts that you'd need, so north, south, east, west, top and bottom, six cuts, you're talking a year of labor to cut that one box to make those cuts using copper bars, a year of just grinding. And that's, that doesn't include how they hollowed it out and everything else, just the base cuts. And when you extrapolate that to the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of granite blocks, of basalt blocks, of blocks from other types of stone that have all had to be quarried out first from the quarry, which takes just as long, if not longer, with these primitive methods, shipped to the site and then gr and then cut down to basically their final their dimensions. And then you've probably got years of work. Just this is with primitive methods, years of work on top of that, just finishing it and hollowing it out and doing all the other stuff. It's I. I the calc it, it just takes it from the realm of the improbable into the impossible. Like they, they, they had to have been working with the stone at a faster rate uh, in the old kingdom. And you have big blocks like in the, the Great Pyramid that weigh up to 70, 80 tons, uh, single piece. That big know. slab that we were just looking at a minute ago with the kind of like curvature mm -hmm. toward the end, like the smooth part of it had a big, the end of the, where the smooth part met the rough part, it was like mm -hmm. large curve. Yeah. Like are there any so like circular saws that big today that could cut that? Yeah. So the, there, there are, are there okay. are circular saws, not generally that big. And then, again, it could have been a swing saw, so it could have been a curved blade that was swinging back and forth. So we okay. do do it. So if you look at modern stone processing videos, which I show a few of in um, in my videos, uh, that is how we do it. We use large circular saws, large swing saws, or large like well, like wire saws that are reciprocating, go back and forth, and mm. it's just just full of like water, and it's noisy, and it's dusty, and, it's just, and takes forever. Because cutting this type of stone for your kitchen counter or whatever is 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 very very difficult, mm. and this is just so this is machining. You asked me what the three things were that I think are evidence of of of, of ancient high technology. One of them is machining, so that's the evidence for cutting, right. polishing, and all of that. Uh, the polishing is interesting too because pol and this gets into some of the other discussions around the writing and the differences between the writing and not, but. You know, polishing a flat surface, so the way the mainstream talks about how they polished it, well, you'd get sand and rock and water and you just grind away. You just sit there and polish it away. You'd slowly you'd get to this point where in some of this granite still reflects lights like a mirror. It's insane. The finish right. on some of it is incredible. Not a natural property of granite. You have to work at it really hard to get there. Right. And then in other areas, though, we see evidence for this type of same polishing in, in non-flat surfaces. So in really bumpy flat side surfaces, like the, the features of statues, the fingernails and this and that. So we see that polish that are on non-flat surfaces and that 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 blows this theory of like stone and sand and water, like like out of the, out of the water, it just, it blows it away. It, that's You can't polish surfaces like that um, with that method, but we see the same, we see that polish on these dips and curves and all these other really strange surfaces uh, all over the place. <laughs>